Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. It's the monster from the swamp, Regis Ruguru Program. Hey, what's up? This is King Carlos Polina, former IBF world champ. This is Michael, the bounty hunter, 2012 Olympian and your people's champ. This is Charlie Edwards, flyweight champion of the world. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 282 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as ever, by, you know who it is already, it is the former heavyweight world title challenger, Mr. Fast Eddie Chambers. Eddie, how we doing, my man? Well, good, good. Good today, my man. How are you? Always good when speaking with you, my friend. Always good. Getting on to part one, we're going to start here, of course, with the review part, and it was shocking. I'm going to start here with a card that took place um, on Thursday of last week, Thursday, March the 4th, in the Municipal Boxing Gym, Felix Pagan Pintor in Puerto Rico. Over here, a show promoted by Tom Loeffler and Miguel Cotto. Now, this was wild because we had Sergei Bohachuk, Eddie, a guy with a beautiful record, 18-0 and with 18 KOs. He stepped in there against Brandon Adams, a guy who, I think he won the contender or something like that, one of the late series, you know, like the most recent kind of series of the contender, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he went into the bout with a record of 22-3. and three. He had a he had a loss on points over 12 to Jamal Charlo back in 2019. He got stopped in two rounds by John Thompson. And his other loss came to Willie Monroe Jr. back in 2014. Anyway, um, yeah, he got in there against Sergei Bohachuk. Like I say, perfect, beautiful record. 18-0, and 18 KOs. And the upset was sprung. Unbelievable. Um, Bohachuk, he got put down in the final round. He got back up. He was on wobbly legs. It was waved off. Um, I tweeted very early on, about 30 seconds into the first round, I, I, I tweeted that Bohachuk was open all night for the left hook pretty much from the first round. And every time um, Brandon Adams threw the shot, he landed it. Bohachuk was, was up at the time at a stoppage on the cards. Adams started brightly in the first round kind of two rounds, but he seemed to to fade, and Boa Chuck's got this real high work rate, and it started to shine through, but he just wasn't able to, to put a proper dent in Adams, and Adams, I guess with the experience on his side, fighting American fighters, you know, fighting fighting good fighters, um, not not necessarily big names or anything like that, but I think he's a bit more seasoned than Boha Chuck, perhaps. And yeah, he was able to catch him, like I say, in 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 the final round, uh, which which was round eight. And um, yeah, he just went for it. Huge, huge credit. Left hook after left hook for um, f for Brandon Adams for the finish there. And that is a big, big upset. We keep seeing big upsets, um, you know, in boxing, in all sports. Actually, it's something to do with this with this pandemic. I'm telling you, it is crazy. Moving out now to the H Arena in Nantes, France. Over here, Tony Yoka, the Olympic gold medalist, now 10 and 0. He was able to TKO in in the 12th. Twelfth and final round, Joel DeJecco, the the uh, the Belgium fighter. It was for the vacant EBU European Union heavyweight title. Yoka now ten and zero. Jeco now seventeen and three with a draw on the undercard. His wife Estelle Yoka. She's now nine and zero. Also an Olympic gold medalist. She defended successfully her IBO world female lightweight title against Verena Kesa, who's now fourteen and two. Um, moving out now to the Dalt Federal Event Center in Flint, Michigan, USA. Over here, um, Clarissa Shields, a win for her. She's now 11-0, and 0, a unanimous decision over 10 two-minute rounds against Marie-Yves DeCare, who I think held the IBF title, if I'm not mistaken. So now Clarissa Shields becomes undisputed in... At 154, as well as, I think in the past, she was undisputed. I think it was at 168, I want to say, or 160, whatever. 
Um, and yeah, she completely won by a shutout. The commentary, by the way, was was dreadful, actually. I have to say it. I don't like to be too negative, but the commentary, man, I don't think they praised the other girl not even once in the entire fight. And, uh, you know, she was outclassed, obviously, and we knew what was going to happen and stuff like that. But they just gave her no credit. Like, she'd land a shot and Shields would land a shot right at the same time, simultaneously, like I'm talking about, not jabs, I'm talking about like, um, they'd land a hook at the same time, completely unnoticed for the challenger, no mention of it at all, just Shields, uh, oh what a shot from Shields, I don't like to see that, I like Clarissa Shields obviously, uh, you know, we, we've got a history, she's been on the on the podcast a few times, and I've got no no liking for De Care, um, necessarily, but yeah, I didn't really like the commentary, but a good win for Clarissa Shields, you know, she is making history whether you like her or not, a lot of people aren't, aren't a fan of her, I am, um, they're talking about possibly her going down to 147, which really will be a struggle if Katie Taylor were to move up, that would be a mega fight we'd all love to see. Moving out now to... Uh, to Saturday night at the Firat Arsland Sports Centre in Germany. Who fought on this card, I wonder? The man himself, Firat Arslan, in his own arena. He promoted the show and boxed in the main event. He picked up a win. He's now 48-9 and nine with three draws. A KO for him in three rounds against Gusmir Perdomo, who's now 26-10. and 10. Firat Arslan, 50 years of age. He's still rated as the best cruiserweight in Germany. It is bizarre, but that is boxing. Uh, that is it, though, for the review part of the show. We've flown through that as quick as possible. Uh, just before we wrap up part one, the final thing to do is to welcome our sole guest on this week's podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former WBO Super Lightweight World Champion. He is, of course, Mr. Maurice Mighty Mo Hooker. Maurice, welcome to the show, my man. Hey, how's it going? Thanks, thanks for having me. Hey, it's absolutely my pleasure. It is going really well. Listen, Maurice, I have known about you for a long time now, but to the more kind of casual audience, especially in the UK, you seem to burst onto the scene right after beating our very own Terry Flanagan, for which we uh, we still don't forgive you for. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you, you become world champion that night in Manchester. After that, you become even more known, obviously defending the title twice against two undefeated fighters. You box in the unification after that with Jose. Ramirez. Now, Ramirez was the fifth undefeated guy you boxed in a row. Uh, it was a great fight while it lasted. It's definitely a thing of the past now, of course, but just give me a couple words on how you look back on that fight there. I uh, mean, I look at look back at it like, me. I should have I fought my fight. I fought that fight in anger. I mean, I had uh, some stuff happened uh, the fight week with my uh, old manager I got rid of. But so I fought that fight with a lot of anger. You know, I didn't really stick to the game plan. And uh, I'm, I'm here now, and I'm prepared for uh, next week, March 20th. Absolutely. And obviously, after that fight, you made a big decision to, to move to welterweight, to change trainers. You're now training in the same gym as Terence Crawford, as Jamel Herring, fellow top fighters. You've got Reg, you've got Bomac in that gym. How's that working for you, man? I uh, mean, it's, it's going good. Now, I'm loving it. It's like family. I mean, I learned something new. Almost every, I mean, every day, you know, so I'm just learning on the job, you know, so I'll be ready to go. And again, the move up to welterweight, you were always known at 140 for having a huge frame, being really big for the weight. Is this weight class a more kind of natural weight class for you now? Oh, yeah, this is more natural, you know. I can make 147, I mean, 147 easy. I mean, 140 is a struggle, you know, a lot of. You know, I made weight then, you know, like middle of the fight, I was get sore, my legs get sore. But 147 will be definitely easier. I'm going to bring my power with me and I'm going to be ready to go. And you mentioned your next fight is locked in for March 20th next weekend against the undefeated Virgil Ortiz Jr. Um, how much do you rate him as a fighter? Obviously, he's got this very uh, pretty 100% knockout ratio, but how do you assess that? I mean, I mean, yeah, he got a good record. I mean, that's good, but. I look at everybody he didn't fought, you know, who he been against, and have he been tested? I mean, Zach, have he been tested? I don't, we don't know yet. So come uh, next week, we gonna we gonna find out. Is he the champion? Everybody say he is. Is he is he that guy? Is he the next big thing? And most fighters don't read too much into the numbers, and sometimes it's right 
not to, but you've upset the odds before. You've pulled off wins being an underdog. Are you in any way surprised to be the underdog in this fight? You're a former world champion. This guy, with all due respect, hasn't fought anyone close to your level yet. Uh, man, I, I feel like it was disrespectful. People put me in the underdog to talk about him. I mean, yeah, he was, well, I think, I think his record was 16 0, 16 out there. That's cool, but who have you fought? You know? What level he on? I mean, so yeah, I, I'm kind of disappointed. I'm the underdog and the way they have it, everything set up. Yeah, I was underdog with, uh, you know, Flanagan. But look at him. He, Flanagan was a, one, a champion before I, he fought me. I mean, I, I, I accepted it. Then I went to England and fought him. Then I was the underdog and I fought Alex Sado in Oklahoma. I was the real champion. How can I be the underdog? And uh, you see how they have and I stopped uh, him. So, I mean, now I'm an underdog again. I mean, look at everybody I fought. I fought with probably like six or seven underdogs. I mean, uh, undefeated people. Now, I mean, it's just another, I'm just ready, you know, focused, and uh, that made me train harder. Yeah, and I believe you, like I say, that the worst thing to do is make you the underdog because you seem to thrive off of that. Um, I don't want you to give away too much, but what do you think will be easier for you against Ortiz Jr.? Do you feel like it would be easier to beat him on points or perhaps stop him? What do you think is easier for you? I uh, Easy to uh, stop him. You know, I had power in both hands. You know, have we seen him get punched yet? Have we seen him take a punch? We haven't seen him get, even get hit, you know? So, I mean, we're going to see what type of guy he is. Can he take a punch? Can he take a body shot? You know, and can you know, a lot of people, we're going to find out. Yeah, we're going to see if he can if he can swim in those deep waters that I feel you're going to bring. Um, I'm sure that, you know, sooner rather than later, you want to become world champion at 147. You're currently in the top 15 with the WBC, the WBO, and the IBF. Your gym mate, Terence Crawford, has got the WBO, so we know that fight won't happen. The WBC and IBF champion is the same man, Errol Spence. Is it safe to say that he's the guy you want to fight most in the welterweight division? Uh, I, I want to say that. That's my bro. We kind of we kind of grew up together. We used to fight at the same gym. Okay. So I'll probably go for the WBA. I mean, but you never know. They, you know, you never know. In boxing, you never know. <laughs> That's why we love it so much. And one question I'm dying to ask you, because, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's a great question. It's a great fight. Your old weight class, we're finally going to get to see an undisputed champion. We don't have to wait too long till they get it on. Ramirez versus Josh Taylor. What's your thoughts on that one, Maurice? I mean, I look, can, can Josh Taylor handle his pressure? I, I got him winning, but can he handle uh, Ramirez's pressure? The non-stop coming, the swinging. Can he? Can he handle it? Can he box the whole fight? I mean, I have, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm leaning towards Josh Taylor to win. Okay. Okay. Interesting. But yeah, you're right. I uh, can't wait to see the fight. And of course, the pressure that Ramirez brings always makes it exciting. And just finally, Maurice, before we let you go. I like to ask this question to everyone that we speak to from overseas um, because we get some really good answers. Who would you say springs to mind? I'm putting you on the spot a little bit. When I ask, who's your favorite fighter from the UK? It can be a guy that's fighting still now. It can be a guy that retired 50 years ago, anywhere in history. Who comes to mind? Oh, okay. Let me see. I like like Ricky Hatton. I like Ricky Hatton. He's a pretty exciting fighter. You know, he come to fight. Yeah, no, that's a good one, man. A lot of people say him. He's a he's a popular answer. And just finally, Maurice, um, if you've got any closing message, just to more in particular, I guess your UK supporters. There's a lot of guys who, of course, got to know you after beating Flanagan. They've watched you since then. You know, they've seen you become a world champion. They've seen you unify very quickly. They've seen you beat Salcedo. It's another fight here that we're really, really invested in. What's your message to those guys that support you from over here and want you to pull off this upset win, quote unquote? You know, thanks for the support. It's make sure you watch the fight and don't blink, because I'm coming with everything I have and put my eye to this fight, and I'm gonna give y'all defense something to watch. And I believe every word you say. Listen, Maurice, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you, my friend. I wish you the absolute best of luck for March 20th. I hope you get the win, and I hope to speak to you sometime after, my friend. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part of the show. Just one thing to mention, and we're recording this podcast on 
uh, what are we, on, on, on a Tuesday evening, obviously it'll go out on, um, I think we're going to put it out on Wednesday this week, again this is kind of irrelevant if you're listening to it, um, you know what's gone on if you're listening to it already, but the plan is we're recording it on the Tuesday, I'm hoping to put it out on Wednesday, um, as we speak right now, the one piece of news is that Joseph Parker has split from his long-term trainer, Kevin Barry, and he uh, is currently in the air right now as I speak. He's in the air, but by the time you listen to this, he would have landed, I hope. Um, He's coming from New Zealand to the UK. Rumor has it that Tyson Fury made a suggestion that perhaps... Um, If he's looking for a new trainer, he should look at Andy Lee, who, of course, has um, an involvement in Tyson Fury's camp along with Sugar Hill Stewart. So um, that is apparently the rumor. Um, I was was hoping to get Joseph on, actually, before he jumped on the plane. Um, As it stands right now, it would be great to get him on. Uh, shortly after he lands again if that if that can be done he will be um, our second guest if not then hopefully we'll get him on uh, we'll get him on hopefully for next week's show but if not because right now I'm unsure um, then that is the piece of news what do you think about that Eddie Um, Andy Lee possibly being Joseph Parker's head trainer quite a uh, you know quite a cool one and it's it's based on a suggestion from Tyson Fury again it's a bit of a rumor but um you know when if if Joseph does come on either this week later on in the show or next week then uh, we'll we'll get it from the uh what do they say from the uh the horse's mouth honestly um I like the idea Andy Lee was a cerebral fighter I think you know he he done some good things obviously in his career as a fighter and and I, I think as a trainer uh, with the way he fought and, you know, the way he broke down fights, you know, obviously with, you know, with him being in the ring, I don't think it would be a bad idea. I mean, you know, Joseph Parker is a, a pretty talented fighter. Don't, he's done well already. He's got a, he's got enough of a resume and he understands enough, you know, of, of boxing in the ring. It's not like he has to be brought along. So you know, Andy's job won't be as hard. It's just kind of giving him pointers in certain areas, helping out his, um, you know, helping his IQ a bit in certain parts, you know what I mean? You know, just, just watching over him, so to speak, you know what I mean? Like a, a guy in the corner, sometimes guys, uh, a trainer could be a guy who doesn't really have a lot of boxing experience, you know what I mean? And he's just basically watching over what you do and kind of giving you ideas and, and different things like that in the corner. If I, You know, like just, there's, there's a few trainers out there that, you know, don't really have any boxing experience. But then when you look at Andy Lee, obviously he has a lot. So, it will even improve improve uh, uh, Joseph Parker as as a fighter. I believe. I mean, I'm not saying that his trainer in the past wasn't good. Obviously, he was you know a pretty good trainer. Got him to a world title. So, um, uh, but I just think this is a good marriage. It can de- definitely work out if that's what's going on. And so it's uh it's something I'm actually looking forward to. I want to see what what uh, Andy can do as a trainer and and you know as Joseph Parker's with him and what uh, Joe can do as a fighter. Yeah, because you know his, uh, his former trainer, Kevin Barry. You know who that is, though, right? The name sounds familiar. I He's the you... guy who Evander Holyfield got um, disqualified against in, in the Olympics. Wow. That is him. Oh, that's him. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay. he's been he's been with Joseph Parker for, for a long time. I, I actually... I'm actually happy that they've split. And I, I mean that for two reasons i mean it firstly because and more importantly because i think joseph parker's looked a little bit stale um and i like joe i really like joe but i think he's looked a little bit stale a little bit kind of disinterested in his last few fights uh despite winning them all um he just hasn't looked he's looked a bit flat and the other reason is that um i'm not going to go into it but kevin barry was quite um well, more than quite rude to to, to me on one occasion. So, uh, okay. yeah, I've, yeah, I've never really, uh, I've never really been his biggest fan since he um, was quite rude that? to me unprovoked. Uh, shall I say? It? Let me think. Um, no, I can say. It, I guess it's it's not it's not it's not that big of a deal. Um, when Joseph Parker came to the UK to fight um, Joshua. He was training inside David Hayes' gym. And if you remember Malik Scott, 
was in um, Parker's camp for that fight. So he actually travelled to the UK with Parker and he was kind of overseeing things and he was there in Hayes' gym. And obviously me and Malik go back a long way as well. So I got to see him and I was kind of like um, speaking with him. And then it was at the time when basically they'd asked the media to clear out of the gym. And I was, you know, no one had actually left yet, but people were getting ready to go. And I maybe might have been standing in a, in a kind of area of the room that maybe looked like I didn't want to leave, but that wasn't the case. I was just simply talking to Malik and he decided to come over and basically say, you know, like, who are you then? And I said like who I was and he didn't care for who I was. And then he just said like, um, you'll be going with them as well then, you know, and he just walked off and I thought, what the, what the hell's wrong with you? You know? So yeah. yeah so, uh, and I, yeah, like, just you know things like that can just ruin your day kind of thing so uh yeah, cool. i f- felt felt a bit yeah. silly to be honest and um yeah, yeah um, kind of it ruined the moment because like i say i probably hadn't seen malik for a couple of years and then like you know that and, and he saw the whole thing is it, yeah you know it wasn't nice so uh i've seen him do interviews though and he comes across like he's a really nice guy but obviously with 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 the cameras off on that occasion that was enough i'm not i'm not gonna wish him much success after that but yeah, well, because well, see, the thing is, a lot of guys like, like, like that, you know, they they don't really have a lot of shine, you know, in in, in recent time, and they want to feel sometimes like a little more important, or either he's either that, or I mean, he's a trainer too, so I mean, he's kind of like in the limelight a little bit, but or it's they don't see you as anything, so it's like they treat you like you ain't shit because they feel that you're not shit, and it, and the reality of that is, is that's just not that's not that's not right at all you should treat no matter who you're talking to especially a a person a member of the media because now granted media people can be dickheads and they can do dirty shit but that that wasn't obviously what you were doing no all you were doing was talking to a friend you know what i mean and that's that's kind of just it's 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 kind of unfortunate that that things like that happen but you know don't feel bad i mean this happened to the best of them shit remember remember at uh at uh ivana's fight uh, and yeah. I was back and the motherfucker stopped me. I'm like, of all the motherfuckers in the yeah, pit, you stopped yeah, me. But, yeah, but Eddie, that was a that was a security guard who's, you know, exactly. their job is to be mean at times. You know, no, it wasn't even that he was being mean. Yeah, it was but, just of all the people, he stopped me. No, I know. I, know. I the one. I had all it. Now you know, I I get it. He didn't know who I was. I'm not even that big of a name. I'm a big enough name, but in the area, like, but still, of all people, he stops me in the camp. Like, and I say, you know what? I don't argue with, you know, the, the, I don't argue with them. I don't. I don't. I just don't. So, no, anyway. no, no, no. But this was just like, um, for, for no reason at all. And, um, I remember his son, his son was there as well. And Malik was saying to his son, like, oh, take a picture of, of me and Joey, you know, and, uh, and like he did, he took a couple pictures, and then Malik said to me like, "Oh, let's jump in the ring, like let's jump in David Hayes, uh, you know, his ring, and take a picture." And um, and Kevin Barry's son was a bit like, "Oh no, no, don't do that, like that'll go crazy." And and Malik even looked a little bit like, uh, like, what? Um, say again, like what? Like no, no, no. He what? even looked a little bit like, "Oh, right, yeah, yeah, we better not do that." Then like he was almost a, a little bit. I don't want to say weary, but a bit like he didn't want to get on the wrong side of him as well. So I don't know, I, <laughs> bad energy all round. But let's move on because he, he doesn't yeah. really deserve a mention uh, on on, no. this, on this show. Yeah. Anyway, um, getting on to the preview part of the show, we're going to go now to Friday the twelfth of March in the Bolton Whites Hotel in the UK. Over here, it's going to be on ESPN Plus as well for the for the listeners in the states. Lewis Crocker. 12 and 0 for the WBO European welterweight title against Dennis uh Dennis Ilbay who's 22 and 2 sorry yeah no 22 and 2 um Gary Cully 11 and 0 fights for the vacant WBO European lightweight title against Viktor Kotichigov who's 12 and 1 that one loss came to Maxi Hughes when he had a brilliant 2020 um he upset him in Dubai 
Um, also on the card, one of our friends, uh, both me and you, Eddie, Isaac Lowe, one of the most underrated fighters in Britain, 20-0 and 0 with three draws. He's back in a six-rounder against Johnny Phillips, who's 5-6. and six. Moving out now to Australia, one fight to mention over here, down under, um, Ebony Bridges, a lady that's massively spoken about in the sport of boxing, probably not for her boxing skills. She's back in an eight-rounder. Um, she's 4-0. and oh. It's for the vacant Australian National Boxing Federation Australasian female super bantamweight title. <laughs> in the other corner, Carol Earl, who is 3-3 three three with a draw. Um, yeah, Ebony Bridges, I think, wins that fight, then comes straight to the UK for, I think it's a world title fight next for her. I'm excited to see her over here anyway. Um, in another part of Australia, at the Bendigo Stadium, Michael Zarafa, uh, 27 on 4, former opponent of Jeff Horn, former opponent of Kel Brook. Uh, he fights for the vacant WBA Oceana middleweight title against Anthony Mundin. I think he's probably retired about four times, but he's back here. 50, sorry, not, yeah, no, this will be his 59th fight. He's 48 and 10. Um, Blake Caparello as well on the undercard. 30 and 3 with a draw against Faris Chevalier, who is 11 and 1. That's over 10 rounds there for the WBA Oceana light heavyweight title. Um... Moving out now to Thailand, we've got Wisaksel Wangek, 49-5 and five with a draw. The man that stopped Chocolatito Roman Gonzalez twice. He's back against Ekowit Songnoi, who is 50-7 and seven with a draw. Um, I think that's still going ahead there, but, you know, Wangek, as I always say, absolutely loves, uh, he, he loves to, to eat rodents in his spare time. Um, Mohegan Sun Casino now in Connecticut, USA. Um, going over here for friend of the show, David Benavidez, 23-0. and 0. He's back against Ronald Ellis, who's 18-1 and 1 with two draws. That's over 12 rounds there. Uh, also on the card, Quadratillo Abdukokorov, who is 17-0. and 0. He's in a 10-rounder against Javier Flores, who's 15-2. and 2. He's up in the rankings, um, Abdukokorov. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's up in the rankings at welterweight. A decent fighter by all accounts. Haven't seen much of him. Also on the card, Jamonte Clark, who's 15-1 and 1 with a draw, takes on friend of the show, Terrell Goulchet, who's 21-2 and 2 with a draw. He has had a bit of a stop-start career. Not not much momentum gathered for Gaucher, unfortunately. And moving out now to the American Airlines Center in Dallas, Texas, USA. Over here, Solomon Sissoko, 11-0 in an eight-rounder. No opponent just yet. Austin Williams, 7-0 in an eight-rounder against Dennis Duglin, friend of the show, 22-7. A lot of people will be um, hoping that Dennis Duglin can actually pull off the upset there. It will be an upset. He hasn't had much notice, but he's a good guy, Dennis Duglin. I'd like to see him win. Also on the card for the WBA Super World Light Flyweight title, Hiroto Kayaguchi, 14 and 0 against Axel Vega, who's 14 and 3 with a draw. Juan Francisco Estrada, 41 and 3, takes on Chocolatito Roman Gonzalez, 50 and 2. It's for the WBC and WBA World Super Flyweight titles. This really is one for the hardcores, man. But um, I've got to say, Eddie, do not miss this one. This is going to be a brilliant fight. The pair have, have, have had a. Um, I think they've had one or two before. Again, I don't follow the lower weights as as well as I should, but I know this is a a fight for the hardcores. This is a good, really good fight. It it you know it, it definitely will contain action and a rematch. I've left it till last on the card. Um, they say ladies first. I've gone ladies last here. Jessica McCaskill nine and two defends her WBC, WBA, IBF, IBO, and WBO welterweight female world titles against the former undisputed champion Cecilia Brackhouse, who is thirty six and one. It's over ten two minute rounds. Um, again, I was gonna be interviewing Brackhouse before the fight, um, the first the first fight I should say, and it fell through. Because, well, it's a long story, but it fell through. Fight took place and Jessica McCaskill pulled off the upset. And then I just got Jessica on the show. 
and you know here's the rematch and since then I've, I've found out a lot more about Jessica like I say you know she went from being homeless to becoming an undisputed world champion and she is a huge inspiration and she is so good for women's boxing honestly and I am supporting her in this fight. I hope she can go out and and win because the first fight was extremely close. It really could have gone either way. Perhaps she got a bit lucky that the fight was in the U.S. Imagine if the fight took place, uh, you know, in 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 Brackhouse's backyard. Um, you know, it could have been extremely different. So it's a great, great fight. It's a great, great rematch. It's for the undisputed titles there at welterweight, and hopefully the winner gets a big fight. But I'd like to see McCaskill win. I'd like to see her win more decisively. But Brackhouse just has the the mindset of a true champion. She, you know, is so experienced, so well schooled. You know, trains alongside men all the time. I think so does McCaskill, but. I don't know, man. Brackhouse is... I think she's coming with something special this time around. And I think McCaskill will have to be even better, if it's possible. Because that was by far the best performance of her career. By the way, look out for this. And if you see it, then um, I'm going to give away a, a little prize, actually. There's a competition right here. Jessica McCaskill supposedly has... The, the the name Box Hard Podcast written on her well over here we call them on on like her I, I guess uh, track bottoms you know tra- track suit bottoms whatever but she has got apparently uh, for fight week she's got these fight pants as she refers to them and apparently they say Box Hard Podcast on them so if anyone that's listening to me the first person that sees them on social media or on the TV, whatever it is, and takes a picture of them uh, with 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 Box Hard Podcast clearly on show. The first person to take a picture of that and send it in will win um, a Box Hard Podcast T-shirt, which, by the way, um, is a prized possession now worldwide. So the lucky person that sends that in, the first person, um, I'm hoping it's still happening. It was supposed to be happening. I haven't heard anything for a while, but apparently... Uh, it says Box Hard Podcast on her Fight Week pants. So uh, that is that is interesting. And the final fight to mention, it actually takes place on Tuesday of next week. But I'm going to mention it here because by the time the show goes out next week, the fight would have took place and we will review it. But it's part of the previewing right here. It's happening at the Hotel Plaza in Quebec, Canada. Over here, the, the, the ring return, finally, of Oscar Rivas. He hasn't boxed since that uh, that loss to, to Dillian White. And it was a brilliant, brilliant fight. I couldn't wait to see him back in a ring right after that fight. Dillian White obviously has come back. And he's been stopped, you know, he's been stopped by Povetkin. He's, he's, he's in a big rematch coming soon in Gibraltar. But Oscar Rivas completely gone off the, off the radar, off the back of his biggest you know, profile fight, and it, it doesn't make much sense, he's back here in an eight-rounder against Silvera Lewis, who's eight and five, but there's still some big, big nights for Oscar Rivas, the thing is, that fight against Dillian White was in 2019, I know there's been a pandemic, but he really needs to get moving now, um, he's a dangerous fight for a hell of a lot of the top heavyweights, but anyway, that's it for the preview part of the show, the final thing to do, just before we wrap up this week's podcast, is for me to come in with the outro in just a few seconds. Okay, and this wraps up episode 282 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Coastman. Eddie Chambers has been with me for the duration of the show. A massive thank you to our sole guest on this week's podcast, the former WBO super lightweight world champion, Maurice Hooker. The biggest thanks of all, though, goes out to you, the listeners. We will try to get Joseph Parker on next week's podcast, as everything was a little bit rushed this week, and the show has gone out a day early. Remember to tell a friend to tell a friend about the podcast be on the lookout for jessica mccaskill's pants stay safe enjoy your weekends people and we shall see you all again next week